I got a call a few nights ago, and it was from an unknown number. I never answer calls from unknown numbers, but last night was a different situation for me. Me and my girl share an apartment. The thing is, she normally comes home at 7 p.m., and she always calls me when she's running late. On that particular night, however, it was already 9 p.m. when I got the call. My girlfriend hadn't come home yet, and she wasn't answering my calls. I thought for sure she was in a pickle of some sort and was likely calling me with someone else's phone. That's why I took the call. Anyway, I answered the call with a hello, and the man answered on the other line. He said, Is this George? Yeah, that's me. Who is this? I replied. George, I know where you live, where you work, and I know where your girlfriend is right now. Wait, who the hell is this? I interrupted him angrily. Maggie's in a Starbucks with an acquaintance. I'm really close to where she is. Are you sure you want to piss me off? The stranger threatened. I stayed quiet since I didn't want to aggravate the situation in case he was telling the truth about Maggie. I mean, who knows what this guy's capable of? The stranger continued. From this day on until the day you die, whenever that may be, be sure to sleep with one eye open every single night from your own. It could be tonight, tomorrow, or 10 years down the road, but I'm coming for you. And your girl? She'd be cherry on top if she's still with you when it finally happens. Then he hung up. I've been retracing my life ever since I got the call. I tried to remember whom I might have pissed off so much to get a call like that. But I couldn't think of anyone. So a day after the call, I spoke to Maggie about the incident and asked if it could be someone that she knew. She wasn't sure, but she did mention about an ex-boyfriend who's an ex-felon. But that's not all. The guy on the phone was telling the truth about Maggie talking to someone in a Starbucks. Maggie confirmed that. She wouldn't tell me whom she met up with, but she did admit she was present in the said location and in the specified time. The ex, as it turns out, did five years in the penitentiary for extortion and fraud, or so Maggie says. I say that because, as a matter of fact, Maggie has a much more colorful past than she let on initially. To simply put, the friends she used to roll with are not exactly the sort of people any normal person would want to associate with. And that's putting it lightly. I'm currently in a situation where I'm possibly being stalked by an ex-felon. The ex-felon has made his intention clear as day, but of course I can't be sure that it's going to go through with that. I'm in a pickle. The police can't help me. I don't have the heart to break up with Maggie. I mean, I don't even know that breaking up with her would dissuade her ex from putting me on a chopping block. I had a pretty good life up until now. I'm not rich, famous, or uber successful, but I did fairly well for myself. But damn it, one wrong girlfriend is all it took to turn my life upside down. I led a clean life and never had to deal with the sort of people Maggie hung out with in the past. I don't know what to do. I think I'm fudged. My sister's got a new boyfriend recently, and she's been spending a lot of time with him. I saw him more times than I can count in our house, and we were introduced, but that was the extent of our interaction. I'm not all that chummy with my sister, and we don't really share much of our lives with each other. With that introduction out of the way, I was at the shopping mall the other day with my friends to grab a couple of socks and a pair of runners. On the way to the Nike store, I thought I saw someone familiar. So I looked at him closely and saw that it was Teddy, my sister's new boyfriend. Now, normally, I would just walk away without saying hi, but something about the way he walked and behaved looked mighty suspicious. Look at it this way. Strangers wouldn't look at him twice, seeing as there are hundreds of people at the mall at any given time. But it's different for me. I know the dude. It's only natural that I'll pay closer attention to those that I recognize in the sea of strangers. So yeah, I knew right off the bat, Teddy was acting really strange in public. It looked almost like he was evading someone. Like he didn't want to be recognized by others. Him wearing a pair of sunglasses and a baseball cap kinda backed up my presumption. Seriously, 
only those up to no good wear sunglasses indoors. Everyone knows that. Anyway, Teddy walked away and that was the end of it. I thought it weird and somewhat creepy, but it wasn't something to make a big fuss about. A few days passed after that, I was supposed to meet up with some friends at a local theater and I got there some 40 minutes too early. I was walking around town to pass the time when I saw Teddy walking across the street. What I found weird is that he was once again wearing a hat and a pair of sunglasses. I get it, the fact that he wears those things doesn't sound weird on face value. But as I had mentioned, I saw him more times than I can remember in my house. But here's the thing, I never once saw him wearing either. And thus my suspicion that he was trying to hide his identity. What I did next was to follow Teddy and observe what he was up to. The first thing that I noticed was the pace of his walk changing very frequently. After a while, it was obvious that he was following someone. It was easy to figure out because he was doing the same thing that I was doing. I would get closer to Teddy so I could observe him from a closer distance, then suddenly back away when I felt that I was getting too close. Well, Teddy was doing the same thing, but obviously with a different target. I followed him for some 5 minutes until he stopped and turned his body toward a storefront. I did pretty much the same thing and continued observing him. By that point, it was clear as day that he was following a woman who looked to be in her early 30s. It was from a distance, but I could tell that the woman looked very attractive. The first thing I thought was that he might have feelings for her. I wanted to rationalize the situation, but it was tough. For anyone else, I wouldn't know, but to me, it isn't normal to be stalking someone that you don't know or even someone you know for a matter of fact. In any event, the woman was buying something from a newsstand. When she was done, she continued walking a bit more until she entered the building that looked to be a residential apartment. The next half hour, my assumption about the whole situation was 99.9% .9 confirmed. I patiently waited for half an hour, observing everything Teddy was doing. The dude stood in front of the lady's apartment, he was looking up by the way, presumably at her unit, and they just stared at it forever. He looked down and around from time to time, probably so he wouldn't look too weird. But his eyes were mostly fixated at the apartment. So after the 30 minutes were up, not only did I have to go to my friends at the theater, but I already had confirmed he was a weirdo. I went to the theater and told my friends that I had to go. I went home after that and showed my sister the photos I took of Teddy and explained to her what he was up to. Yep, I had the foresight to gather some evidence to make my case. At any rate, Kelly didn't want to believe it, but she knows I don't much care for her or what she does with her life. She understands that I wouldn't have made such effort for her unless I was sure that something really weird was going down. I don't know what she's going to do with the information, but I did tell her to bring Teddy to our home if she's going to talk to him about it. And to do it when I am around of course, just in case you never know with these weirdos. I haven't done so yet, but I'm leaning towards telling my parents about it too. It is possible that I'm wrong about the whole thing, but that seems unlikely. It's probably best to involve the adults in on this. We'll see what happens. Alright, so this is me. I'm 22 years old, single, male, a sous chef, and a resident of Seattle. I live in an apartment, a second floor unit, located in the middle of a bustling city. With that out of the way, I'm writing to you today to tell you of something bizarre that's been happening to me for the last 3 weeks, give or take a few days. The first time I noticed that was when I was walking home after work. The restaurant I work at is 9 blocks away from my place. I do my commute on foot and I leave work between the hours of 10 p.m. through 11 depending on how good the business is on any particular day. So yeah, roughly about 3 weeks ago, I got out from work at 10 p.m. sharp and was walking home as I always do. As per usual, there weren't that many people out on the streets. I passed by a few here and there and that was about all the normal people I saw. Now here's the reason why I said normal people. 
The reason being, during the nine blocks of short commute I did, I saw five men wearing something that looked similar to a ski mask. I say similar because their masks didn't have the hole for the eyes. Instead, it looked as though the fabric that covered the eyes was very thin to make it transparent. The masks were white, by the way, and they had some exotic symbols drawn or printed on them in black. The masks definitely made them look menacing. I'd also point out that they didn't show up in a single spot altogether. I would see one at the corner of a block, then see another a couple of blocks down, and you get my drift. I don't know what the laws are on face masks, but I tell you, legal or illegal, it feels really unsafe to be around people wearing them. The thing is, this wouldn't be an issue if their sighting was a one-time incident, but if you see them every day after work, that's a problem. It's as though the night is theirs. At least, that's the case in our town. You hardly see the police once it's dark, and it's not like we have many businesses open at night. The masked people roam freely, and there's no one to stop them even though everyone's sort of on the edge about the whole thing. I spoke about it to the owner of the corner store, and he's been seeing them frequently as well. He really doesn't like them because they're bad for business. And no wonder, we've got psychos, okay check that, potentially psychos, making their presence be known all around town and the police ain't bothering to do a thing about it. Who in the right mind would want to walk around the town at night? Things have been getting worse lately. I have been followed home for two nights in a row the last couple of days. They didn't do anything but follow, but really, that's enough to make anyone feel unsafe and uncomfortable. One final note, after I was followed home last night, I went up to the window as soon as I entered my apartment. I wanted to see what they would do once I left them behind. I pushed my fingers through the blind slats to get a better look and saw that one of them was already looking up to my apartment. I think they already knew where I lived since they had followed me the previous night as well. Two nights ago when I got home, they must have waited outside until one of the dark apartments lit up. It's likely that's how they found out where I lived. I spoke to a police officer in the morning. He was on a regular patrol and I just happened to bump into him. Guess what he told me? He said, we'll look into it and left me without allowing me to finish my thought. Sure, we'll look into it. I'm sure they'll look into it after the fact. As a young boy, I used to be fascinated by scary stories and especially the ones about haunted houses. People normally grow out of those fantasies as they age, but it was not the case for me. Once I turned 18, I started visiting every haunted property in my city. I'm talking about the ones that are famous locally. And yeah, I continued investigating the spirit realm well into my late 20s. Until I stopped. There was a good reason for it. The reason was a particular haunted house that I had a chance to visit. It's the house that ended my long pursued hobby. I'm not gonna name the property nor where it's located. It is my personal belief that the haunted house in question is extremely dangerous. If I can help it, I don't want anyone going near it. I hope you can understand that. So this property, I was tipped about it by a friend of mine who lived a couple of states west from mine. At the time, Max had been residing there for six months. He used to work in construction and landed a job there in a fairly large project. It was at the construction site that he was told about the haunted property. He was having a conversation with a few co-workers during lunch. Max happened to mention about me and my hobbies. And the co-workers told him about a famous haunted house in the area. That's how I ended up there. I met up with Max once I got there. It was a Saturday afternoon and the plan was to go to the property at night and stay there overnight. I normally like to go to those places alone. It's much easier to concentrate and take in everything. However, Max wanted to be part of it as well. Not much so because he was excited about the new haunted house, but rather because it reminded him of the adventures we had when we were young back in our hometown. We used to share the passion as young boys. The difference is, Max grew out of it, but I didn't. 
That said, we arrived at the haunted property at 9 p.m. Max had already made reservation for the night, and it was all paid and done. The house was well maintained and really clean too. It was clear that the owners were making good money with that. I also thought that it was clever that the owners didn't reside or have employees there at night. What they do is, you drive to the owner's house at night. The owner checks your ID. You leave your car in their driveway. Then the owner drops you off at the haunted house at your desired time. I mentioned clever because that makes the house more legit. Most haunted houses either have the owners living or working in the supposed haunted property. To me, that was always the giveaway that the houses were not haunted. It's crazy to think that you would either live or work in a truly haunted property. At any rate, Max and I got set up in different rooms. Max got a bit spooked initially, and he wanted to share the room, but I objected since that sort of defeats the purpose. I visit these houses to investigate them. To do my work well, I need to be clear-headed, and distractions should be avoided at all cost. 9 to 10 p.m., we spent most of the time combing the property for hidden speakers, lights, and other special effect gadgets. By 10 p.m., we said good night and went to our rooms. I sat down on a couch situated in front of a bed. I had my notebook and pen in my hands and patiently waited for any sign of the paranormal. By the way, I don't use gadgets to do my thing. I know in films and TV shows, you see people using EMF meters and digital thermometers and whatnot. I personally don't bother with them. I solely rely on my senses to detect anomalies and document them on paper. I keep things simple. But continuing, it was around midnight when I felt the hairs on my arms stand up and I got goosebumps from it. I didn't see or hear anything, but rather I felt something. Something had stroked my hair. I got extremely excited. In all the years of visiting haunted houses, this was the first time I ever felt that something truly paranormal was happening. I sat there waiting for more signs of ghostly activities. The house didn't disappoint. That night, my shoelaces came undone on their own. I saw what happened with my own eyes. I also saw the pillow being compressed as if a person's head was on it. The fourth and the last thing that happened in my room was seeing my legs being moved by an unknown force. It wasn't a big movement, nor was it forceful, but it was enough to make my legs float in the air like they were some sort of balloons. Then the paranormal activities came to a stop. I waited for an hour, but nothing more happened. That's when I got up and went to the room Max was staying in. I was going to check with him to see if he had experienced anything peculiar, but Max was fast asleep. I thought about letting him sleep, but I just had to tell him what had just happened right there and then. So I tried waking him up as I said, Max, Max, wake up, dude. But Max wouldn't respond. I went over to him and gently shook his shoulders, but still nothing. I began to panic a bit. I put my finger under his nose and it seemed like he was breathing. Then I slapped his face a couple of times, followed by a real strong one. And I got zero reaction from him. That was the point of realization that he wasn't playing a prank on me. I called 911 and Max was taken to the hospital some half an hour thereafter. I was informed by the doctor that physically, Max looked fully healthy. She couldn't explain what was happening. She told me that she had never seen anything like that. If Max became unconscious due to some sort of shock or trauma, he should have been awake at the very least by the time he had arrived at the hospital. But forget that night, Max didn't wake up until three days later. The doctors checked on him, they evaluated him to be perfectly healthy. And most importantly, Max was acting like Max. It didn't seem like he was affected mentally in any manner. I was so relieved. At the end of the whole ordeal, I found out that Max didn't have any memories of the house. He remembers going there but doesn't remember anything that happened there. I stayed with him for another two days just to make sure that it was okay. Then I flew back home and resumed my normal life. A week later, I got a call from Max's mom, Mrs. Henderson, telling me that Max had passed away. 
He had taken his own life by hanging. There was no last letter, no sign that he was struggling with anything. He just did himself in for no apparent reason. I had spoken with him on the phone only a couple of days back. He seemed perfectly fine. Mrs. Henderson tells me that he was doing fine financially, and that there was no trouble in his life. There really was no reason for him to end at all. I thought it hard before the funeral whether to tell Mrs. Henderson about the haunted house. I chose not to. Her having that information wasn't going to change anything. It was only going to make her feel even more terrible. After Max's funeral, I had a chance to speak to several of his co-workers who came to pay their respects. They were all confused and shocked for what happened. No one could understand why such a happy and aspiring person would do such a thing. Sadly, I think I know the answer. It's the house and whatever spirit that inhabited. Malevolent spirits seek to do harm to those that fear them. I wasn't scared at all, but Max was fearful of the house from the get-go. I should have never left him on his own. I've lost a friend because I sought the knowledge of the underworld. Some things in this world are not meant for us to know. If only I had known this sooner, Max would still be with us today.